All right, thank you. So I, I switched from the title and topic that I'd originally uh, planned to talk about to something that I hoped was a little more relevant um, to, to the topic and, and maybe to the audience. Um, I'm following Ted's lead a little bit in talking mostly about, um, or at least the part that is most relevant is actually older work um, that I did a while ago. But to get there, I want to talk about some newer work. Uh, it says joint with David Fernandez Duke, Paul Schaefer, and Katie Yokoyama. Actually, a lot of what I want to talk about is work by the three of them without me, and then a little bit of a contribution by me with the three of them, and then talking about this older uh, related work. So this is, this is a talk about reverse math, and starting with the reverse mathematics of a theorem in fixed point theory, theory called Caristi's fixed point theorem. So the classic fixed point theorem is the Bonnach fixed point theorem. So if you have a metric space, a contraction is a map that takes points in this metric space to other points with the property that when you take two points and you map them to other points, they get closer together. And they get closer together in, in a slightly uniform way. So there's a k less than 1. So if you started with a distance, your new distance is a little bit less than that. <clears throat> and the Bonnach fixed point theorem says if you have a complete metric space and a contraction, then you have a fixed point. So Caristi's fixed point theorem is actually a, a kind of far-reaching generalization. So first of all, and this will cause some issues in the reverse math setting, it concerns not continue. Sorry, I should say Bonnach fixed point theorem. The T should be continuous. Um, and the Caristi fixed point theorem, there's no such requirement. So T is actually an, a completely arbitrary map. Uh, this, is, this is a problem for reverse math. But associated with it, there's this function V. And V is lower semi-continuous. Uh, if you don't remember which direction is lower semi-continuous and which is upper, you'll, it will be clear into the proof why it's exactly what you need. And so the condition is, so instead of being a contraction, we have this condition here that uh, if you take, there's no Y here, if you take any point X, the distance between X and the point that X moves to, T of X, is bounded by the differences in this function V. And if you have a, trans a transformation T on the metric space with this bound, then you, have, uh, then you have a fixed point. So the way to think about this is that V is a potential function. V is measuring you know, the energy, the potential at a point. And the promise is that when you move from a point X to a point T of X, your potential goes down. And the more your potential drops, the further you're allowed to go. And that's what's giving you some control over this function t that's going to guarantee that you have a fixed point. For example, just to illustrate how this gets used, you can derive the Bonnach fixed point theorem. And your potential is 1 over uh, 1 minus k. Remember, k is less than 1, so that's a positive number, times the distance between x and t of x. And then you can go through the calculations to verify that the triangle inequality really gives you the bound you need, that you're not moving by more than the potential drops. So in this case, you have this potential function v, and Caristi's fixed point theorem applies. So you can drive the Bonnach fixed point theorem. You can drive lots of fixed point theorems. It's a very general result. Um, and the proof is actually not very long. Uh, it's a transfinite induction. So you just start with any point, and you, look, you start with your point, and you look at t of that point, and you just apply t inductively. At limit steps, you take limits. And if you think about what has to happen with the potential, it's you know, your potential function at, v at x0 and x1 and x2, this is a non-increasing sequence of positive real numbers. It has to converge at limits, so the points converge at limits, so you, you have limits. Lower semi-continuity is exactly the thing you would need to make sure that your potential doesn't suddenly jump up when you take these limit steps. And then you just do this all of one times, and you have to stop eventually, because you can't have a decreasing sequence of positive reals of length all of one. So you have a fixed point. So 
On the one hand, it's a short theorem. On the other hand, I mean, logicians sort of look at this and, and I think rightly note that this is not an elementary proof because it's got a transfinite induction of, of length omega one. And the natural question to ask from a reverse math perspective is, do you, do you have to prove it this way? Do you really need transfinite induction up to omega, up to omega one to prove this, to prove this theorem? Yep. So, so this is a reverse math talk. We're going to have a few of these three-letter abbreviations. Here's the traditional, these are the big five. I think many, but people know this clearly, but maybe not quite everyone. So right, the classic, rever classic reverse mathematics has this hierarchy of systems. They're usually called the big five. RCA0 is the weakest of these five. It's the base theory over which a lot of, and when we talk about proving theorems equivalent, we're usually saying, proving them using these base axioms RCA0. A lot, a lot, a lot of talks, including I think Benoit's talk this afternoon, concerns things in kind of this, this range between ACA0 and RCA0. Uh, in particular, a lot of results about what happens in that range are really tied to classical computability theory. They, they're not exactly the same as computability theoretic results, but they're very linked to that. And by contrast, the things I'm concerned with here are, are up in this range with the fourth and fifth systems, ATR0 and PI11CA0, because these are the systems that are most closely related to, to higher recursion theory in some sense, and to, for example, the things Antonio was talking about in his tutorial. So ATR0, if you've seen Antonio's presentation, this is very familiar. ATR0 says whenever you have a well ordering, uh, it has a jump hierarchy. You can compute a jump hierarchy along it. Um, ATR0 is, in particular, typically the weakest theory in which you can kind of make sense of what transfinite induction means. There's a technical caveat, which is not too important for this talk, but I want to mention it, uh, which is, if you're thinking about a model of ATR0, right, ATR0, this the axiom ATR0 promises that every time you have a well ordering, you have a jump hierarchy along that well ordering. But being a well ordering is a pi 1 1 property, so your model could be wrong about what the well orderings are. So what the axiom promises is anytime you have a linear ordering, either you can, either not only does it fail to be a well ordering, but you can tell in the model that it's not a well ordering. You actually have a descending sequence in the model, or you have a jump hierarchy. But a typical model of ATR0 is actually going to be, a, a, or many model, natural models of ATR0 are actually wrong about what the well orderings are. They have or, linear orderings they mistakenly believe to be well orderings because the infinite descending sequences are just too complicated to be present. And that's fine as long as the model also has a jump, something that looks like a jump hierarchy to compensate for that. Pi 1 1 CA 0 adds the axiom saying that every Pi 1 1 formula defines a set. In particular, if you want to take a linear ordering and say, what is the well-founded well part of this linear ordering? That's a Pi 1 1 property, so you need Pi 1 1 comprehension to do things like that. So thinking about Caristi's theorem, if we want to ask the question, is a transfinite induction necessary? Saying that the theorem requires ATR 0 is kind of close to saying, some transfinite induction along some well ordering is necessary. And pi 1 1 comprehension is close to saying, actually, we need a transfinite induction all the way up to Aleph 1. We need not just induction along some long countable well ordering, which ATR 0 would give us. We need induction up to Aleph 1, which is something like what pi 1 1 CA lets us do. That's a loose interpretation, but not an unreasonable one. So when we think about Christie's theorem, we're asking, you know, does, does Christie's theorem need pi 1 1 comprehension? That's it's kind of like asking, does it need ATR 0? Does it need pi 1 1 comprehension? All right. So reverse math runs in, in settings like metric spaces, sometimes runs into coding issues. In or, reverse math is, is traditionally done in a framework of second order arithmetic, and in, you can't when you have third order objects like functions on metric spaces, you have to worry about whether you can code these in, in the space. Or 
pass to, to a third order setting. People have increasingly been doing reverse math in third order settings, which, which is another way to address this. But sort of classically, separable metric spaces can be coded in a fairly natural way. Continuous functions can be coded in a natural way. Semi-continuous functions on a separable metric space, there's a coding for them. I don't know how, nat how natural it is is sort of more subjective, but there, there's a fairly good way to encode semi-continuous functions. So if we want to talk about things like semi-continuous functions on a separable metric space, that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do in reverse math. But arbitrary, but arbitrary functions are, are genuinely third-order objects, and we don't, we don't have a handle on those in a second-order theory. So conveniently, you can actually factor Caristi's theorem almost entirely into something called the Eklund variation principle, which I think, if I have the history right, Eklund sort of distilled out of Caristi's theorem within a couple years of Caristi's of Christie's paper. So Eklund's theorem looks like just the potential part. There's a complete, a complete metric space. There's a lower semi-continuous function v. There's no, there's no T, there's no transformation of the metric space. There's just a potential. And what Eklund's variation principle promises is a, a critical point. A critical point is some point X star with the property that for any other point Y, for, excuse me, if, if there is a Y which is, which is close to X star, and close here means in this way that's bounded by the potential, the only way that can happen is if y is actually equal to x star. So this is a critical point in the sense of Eklund's theorem. Now, you can see almost immediately, you can see almost immediately how to get Christie's theorem from this, because a critical point of this is a fixed point for any function t satisfying the condition in Christie's theorem. So if you have a critical point, you just have Christie's theorem. And the proof is the same. I mean, you start with a point x0, and if it's not a critical point, then it, there's some y which demonstrates that. That's the next point in your sequence, and you carry out the same transfinite induction. So you can ask the same questions about Eklund's variation principle. And here, there's no coding issues. This is, uh, except, well, we have to talk about separable metric spaces to do this in second order arithmetic. But other than that, there's no coding issues. So. Uh, so critical point is a point with the property that for if you if there is a y such that the distance between x star and y is less than the difference in potentials. So if there's a nearby point, a point that's sort of close relative to their potentials, then actually that point is x star. Oh, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm writing out yeah, the definition of a critical point. All right, so David, Paul, and Kata proved that pi 1, 1 comprehension is, is necessary to prove this. So Eklund's variation principle is equivalent to pi 1, 1 comprehension. You can carry out the proof using uh, the pi 1, 1 comprehension axiom, and conversely, you can recover the pi 1, 1 comprehension axiom. From it, that's true even if you restrict yourself to like your favorite separable metric spaces. I mean, assuming these are your favorite metric, separable metric spaces. But for most reasonable choices uh, of, a, of a base metric space, that's already enough. Um, they, they furthermore, they go on to consider some variations where you say, well, what if it's compact? What if it's continuous rather than semi-continuous? And if you pile enough restrictions on, you get weaker things. But in the general case, you need pi 1, 1 comprehension. And that's somewhat close to saying you really do need this transfinite induction. Like this transfinite induction up to Aleph 1 really is sort of necessary to prove Eklund's variation principle. Or if not that, some other use of pi 1, 1 comprehension that's going to be equivalent. Uh, and in fact, the proof actually uh, more or less illustrates the way you really sort of just need to do transfinite induction. So the idea is you think of a real in bare space as a sequence of columns. And 
you look at the nth column and you ask, is it encoding an infinite descending sequence in the nth, um, in the nth linear ordering in some sequence of linear orderings I've fixed? And the idea is you can actually set up your potential so that this property, saying that y is near x, is exactly saying what y has done is replace a column where x didn't have an infinite descending sequence with a column where x does have an infinite descending sequence. And in particular, that means a critical point is going to have every, an infinite descending sequence in every column that you could have hoped to have a column in, which is to say you've exactly picked out which columns have infinite descending sequences. So you can just sort of write in the encoding of, of determining which l linear orderings are well orderings in this way. I'm being very loose about it. There's obviously details in writing this out, and, but there's mo the details are mostly getting the coding right. And, and that's not what I want to focus on. All right. So, okay, the proof, once you have the Eklund variation principle, the proof of Christie's theorem is easy. I, I have that in quotes because it's a reverse math talk and saying that a proof is easy sounds like a formal claim and I'm not making a formal claim. Um, if I wanted to make a formal claim, I'd say something like this. Suppose you have a third order theory that contains pi 1 1 comprehension. Since it's a third order theory, you can talk about arbitrary functions on metric spaces. You can prove the Eklund variation principle and any reasonable third order theory is going to then be able to prove Christie's theorem for arbitrary functions because you just take your critical point coming out of the Eklund variation principle and your critical point is a fixed point. There is no additional work necessary to verify that it's a fixed point. So the next question we can try to parse that into is, is, is the Eklund variation principle necessary? So, okay, EVP really is pi 1 1 comprehension. It really needs a transfinite induction. Just Christie's theorem. And, and here we're not going to be able to avoid the coding issues. We're going to have to stop talking about Christie's theorem in general and start talking about Christie's theorem for reasonable classes of functions which we are capable of coding. So... For example, if you only want continuous functions on your metric space, then uh, Christie's theorem, sorry, CFP here is Christie's fixed point theorem. Right? I, so I maybe not, I didn't say this explicitly, but you'll notice I, I'm writing three, these traditional reverse math three letter abbreviations for actual principles formalized in reverse math. And I'm just writing English names for you know, theorems in the English sense. So I've been talking about Christie's theorem before because that was Christie's theorem, the true theorem of mathematics. Here I mean CFP, a, a statement in second order arithmetic whose strength one can consider in the sense of reverse math. So Christie's, so Christie's fixed point theorem for continuous functions implies ACA zero. For bare class one functions, it implies ATR zero. Uh, I don't want to say a lot of details about this, but maybe I should mention the second one, um, just to give, again, a little bit of flavor for how this works. So the idea is you, you do another sort of careful encoding of columns using trees. And the interesting thing about it is if you look at what happens in this proof that uh, CFP for bare class one functions implies ATR zero. You, you construct a potential V and a function T with the property that if, if you happen to start with the empty set, you actually literally compute the jump hierarchy along your well ordering. Like the induction in the proof of Christie's theorem is literally the construction of a jump hierarchy. So the idea is you, you define your function t. It's got to be a limit of continuous functions. since It's bare class one. And you just construct your function t to say, along this well ordering, where have I failed to construct a jump hierarchy? OK, construct the next level of the jump hierarchy. 
And a fixed point of that is going to have to actually be a jump hierarchy along this well ordering, because if it's not a jump hierarchy, there's some place you don't have a jump hierarchy, and T will then fix your construction of a jump hierarchy at the next step. Um, one, one, I should add, the other reason I'm mentioning these results is there, there are a lot of coding issues around where, what happens to even be able to talk coherently about well orderings. And once you're in AT, actually in ATR0, a lot of these coding issues disagree. So it's just convenient that from a relatively simple case of CFP, we already get ATR0, because this means we, we don't have to worry about a lot of coding issues. All right. So the largest class of functions that we could figure out how to sort of reasonably write down was the Borel functions. The Borel functions are a class of functions that are comparatively complicated to code, but you can still code them in a second order way. I've written a sort of abbreviated definition here, um, which the people who knew Borel functions are making faces at me. So this is a slightly weird, compact way to do it. But the idea here is a, to code a Borel set, you need a well-founded tree. And the idea is the leaves of this tree are going to be codes that name open sets in your space. And then at each level, you want to take either a union or an intersection. And you either have to do some coding to deal with how do you do, where do you take unions, where do you in, take intersections, or you can do the thing here where I'm sort of cheating and doing two, doing two alternations at every level so that I can write it in one line. But the details don't matter. The point is, a Borel set is coded by a well-founded tree, and this tree encodes how am I taking unions and intersections to create this set. A Borel function can then be encoded by something that tells you, for every open set, which, um, which Borel set do I map this open set to. All right, so trivially, pi 1 comprehension is certainly going to be enough to give us Christie's theorem for Borel functions because, after all, uh, it gives us Christie's theorem for any function. But Christie's theorem for Borel functions is a pi 1, 2 statement. This is not completely obvious until you sit there and work, down, work out the coding because what it says is, okay, given a complete metric space encoded by some set, a lower semi-continuous function coded by some set, and a thing that purports to be a Borel code. That is to say, a collection of wealth, a collection of trees that are claiming to, to be, for each open set, the well-founded tree coding a Borel set. Either your Borel code is lying. So either one of these trees that was supposed to be well-founded isn't, and you have an infinite descending sequence. Or you have a bona fide Borel function, and then you have a fixed point. And a fixed point should be encoded by a real, by, by a, also by a set. So this is a pi 1, 2 statement. And it's a standard fact in reverse math that pi 1, 1 CA0 is a pi 1, 3 axiom. Um, if you write it down, it says for every set, for all parameters, there's a set y which captures some pi 1, 1 def definition. And that's a pi 1, 1 statement to check. So this is a, a pi 1, 3 statement. And it can't be equivalent to a pi 1, 2 statement. It is a fundamentally pi 1, 3 statement. So uh, since Karisti's theorem for Borel functions can be proven in pi 1, 1 comprehension, it cannot imply pi 1, 1 comprehension. It has to belong to some weaker theory. Um, and it's worth thinking about what happens in the proof. So suppose we look at this proof of Karisti's theorem for Borel functions in pi 1, 1 comprehension. So what happens is we have this Borel function t, and the Eklund variation principle gives us a critical point. And then we apply t to this critical point. We're promised by the definition of t that the distance from x star to t of x star is less than the difference in potential. And since x star is a critical point, it must be that x star is equal to t of x star, which means x star is a fixed point. All right. 
So the trick here is T of X, so Eklund variation principle says X star has this property for any Y. But in this proof, we're not looking for any Y. We're looking at T of X star. T has a Borel code. So T of X star is not some arbitrary point. It is a very specific point that is described by a Borel function applied to X star. And a Borel code has, has a height, has some, some height of an ordinal alpha. And so T of X star can't actually be that much more complicated than X star. Right? T of X star actually has to belong to within you know, alpha jumps and some change of X star, because there's actually a concrete description of it. So we don't need the Eklund variation principle for arbitrary points Y. We don't need, to, we don't need a true critical point which would work for any Y here. We just need, a, need like a fake critical point which works for good enough Ys. So here's a weakening of the Eklund variation principle. So given a complete metric space and one of these lower semi-continuous potentials and a well-ordering alpha, V has an approximate critical point. And what I mean by an approximate critical point is a point, uh, is a point X star so that for any Y which is near X star and which is not too complicated, which is sigma alpha in X star join V, Y has to be X star. So X star doesn't have to be a, a true critical point, but it's hard to distinguish from a true critical point. It, it's faking being cr a critical point for those Ys which are not too complicated. And importantly, not too complicated as a function of X star itself. All right, so there's a general claim here, which is any time you have a statement equivalent to pi 1, 1 comprehension, it's a reasonable statement, it's going to be a pi 1, 3 statement. It's going to be a pi 1, 3 formula, or pi 1, 3 sentence. And they always have these pi 1, 2 approximations. And typically, these pi 1, 2 approximations are all equivalent to each other. And there's a theory, which, which I introduced a while ago, at this strength that I call TLPP0. I'll explain what TLPP stands for in a minute. Um, so notice this, this is. A, uh, a pi 1, 2 statement if you go through it. It's no longer pi 1, 3 because we're not quantifying over all y's. We're only quantifying over y's that have a concrete description. Um, and it is, in fact, equivalent to this theory TLPP0. And furthermore, uh, so are Christie's theorem for bare functions and Christie's theorem for Borel functions. So I, I introduced TLPP0 a while ago. I, I really wanted there to, there were a couple other examples of pi 1, 3 statements, uh, excuse me, pi 1, 2 statements provable in pi 1, 1 comprehension. I showed that all of them were provable from TLPP0, and I really wanted some of them to reverse so that there would be anything else that was equivalent. Uh, but this is the first one we've actually found. So this is Christie's theorem for Borel functions and Christie's theorem for Baer functions are sort of the most natural things, the, the first sort of non-mathematical theorems that have actually been proven to, to sit at this level. And I want to sort of use this as a point to talk about, a jumping off place to talk a little about TLPP0 and where it comes from and why, despite being a little disappointed at, at, at our success at finding equivalence, where it comes from and why I think it's sort of a natural theorem, a natural stopping point. All right, so first of all, let me, so um, I've given several equivalents of TLPP0, but let me give sort of the canonical axiom that's equivalent. I'll give two versions, uh, just to illustrate this, this idea of taking a pi 1, 3 statement and giving an approximate version. So the defining axiom of pi 1, 1 comprehension is, is stated as follows. For, every, for all sets of parameters x and a formula, a formula phi, that should be an arithmetic formula phi. Uh, there's a set Y so that N is in Y exactly if for every set Z, phi of NXZ holds. So this is a comprehension axiom, right? Y is exactly the things for which the pi 1, 1 formula for every Z, N of X, phi of NXZ holds. The relativized version says for all parameters X, for every formula phi, and 
So I'm saying this carefully here. So for every ordering, and either this ordering fails to be a well ordering. But in the interesting case, we have a well ordering. And if we have a well ordering, we have a set y so that, well, y is now this giving this restricted comprehension. Uh, y is exactly the set of n so that for every z which is sig sigma, which is given by the jump hierarchy along this well ordering in the join of x with y, this formula holds. So this is what we mean by, or this is what I mean by a, a sort of an approximation and by a, a restricted comprehension. And the thing I want to emphasize is what's, what's sort of a little, takes a little get, getting used to is that we're looking at sets which are, these sets are allowed to look at y. So y is itself some sort of computational fixed point, whereas y gets more complicated, we have to quantify over more sets. And then y gets more complicated because there are more sets, but eventually we stop at some level with some set y, which is, you know, which captures comprehension up to those sets not too much more complicated than y. I named TLPP after an equivalent formulation. So TLPP stands for transfinite leftmost path principle. And this comes from a different interpretation of pi 1 1 comprehension which is simply every tree has a leftmost path. Uh, that should say every tree which has any path at all. I should say every infinite tree has a leftmost path. So the idea is, well, if you have a tree, there's a path, and there are no paths to the left. So there's a pi 1, 3 statement. For every tree, there is a path such that no path is further to the left. Again, assuming there is a path at all, which I should have said. So the relativized version it has the same form. It says for every tree and every ordering, if it's a well ordering, then there's a path x so that, well, it might not be a leftmost path, but all the paths further to the left are a lot more complicated. So if you only look at paths which are sigma, sigma alpha, sigma in this well ordering of t join x, t join this path, then you don't get any more paths further to the, then you don't get a path further to the left. Uh, the original, mo I guess I, I'll mention the original motivation since um, given the last talk, the original motivation came out of looking at, at statements in WQO and BQO theory, which make extensive use of the leftmost path, this leftmost path idea. And typically the way the proofs of like Higman's theorem and Kruskal's theorem in the literature go, go is they say, well, take a certain tree and take a leftmost path, and then do a bunch of combinatorics to say that if there, you're trying to prove that this tree is well-founded. So you say, if there were a path, there'd be a leftmost path, and then you would construct a tree even further to its left. So what you're doing here is you, you, you look at this construction. These proofs always say, given a path, here is how I construct a path further to its left. They don't say there needs to be no path. They need, say this one particular thing needs to not be a path further to the left. And so that's exactly why this principle ends up being strong enough to carry out these proofs. All right. So the motivation, right? I'm, I'm really a proof theorist at heart. And the motivation comes from proof theory. So I want to explain what, you know, sort of where this idea comes from. Um, so suppose, so these are, Maybe I should have said put, put pi 0, 2, and pi 0, 3 to emphasize. I'm now talking about arithmetic statements. And I'm thinking from the perspective of proof mining. So I'm thinking about, we have a proof of a pi 2 sentence. So for all you, exists a v, and psi is, you know, is really a computable statement about natural numbers. And, but the proof isn't, enti isn't entirely constructive. And in particular, the proof goes through a pi 3 statement. So, it's a general idea coming out of proof theory that when you have a proof of a pi 2 statement, it has to encode an algorithm for computing witnesses. So there has to actually be an algorithm that says, given you, how do I get v? And just, just to motivate things, in the simplest case, what that algorithm looks like goes as follows. <clears throat> so you're given u, and I want to calculate v. Now the proof uses this pi 3 statement, for all x there exists a y for all z. So at some point in the proof, I use u to calculate a value x. 
And which value x I use is, is going to be somehow implicit in the proof. Maybe in a real proof, I use multiple x's or I do things multiple times. But in the simplest case, and the simplest case is often what actually happens, I just use this pi 3 statement once. So I look at u and I calculate a single va value x. And then, well, somehow, there must be a y with this property. And I, I'll say this again, but I emphasize this is not, in general, a computable step. Right? The, given an x, finding the y which witnesses a sigma 2 statement is not going to be t generally computable. But the proof says, well, if you had this y, then somehow you could compute v from it. So the horizontal lines are computable. The vertical line isn't. And the horizontal lines really are somehow encoded in the proof, in, maybe in some hidden way. There's some algorithm that says, given you, find an x. If you then go to an oracle which gives you the correct value of y to witness this statement, then there's an algorithm that tells you, how do I compute v? How do I compute the value I'm looking for from this value y? All right. So it has to be the case that because, <coughs> because y satisfies for all z phi of x, y, z, this computation will give me a value v that does what I need it to do, that satisfies psi of uv. Um, and if you look at this computation, this is this horizontal line, this is, this is a computation. In particular, it happens in finite time. It doesn't have time to check that y actually satisfies for all z phi of x, y, z. It's a finite computation. How could it check all infinitely many values of z? So I have to use the... I presumably use the fact that I satisfy phi of x, y, z for various values of z. But it's a finite computation that only has time to check finitely many of them. So you know, if, you, if I'm trying to, trying to compute this function, I'm trying to compute v from you, and you're trying to help me out, and you conveniently have an oracle for sigma 3 statements, right? I could, I could hand you my values of x, and you would hand me back y's. And if you watched me do this for a while, you could notice that, look, when I actually calculate my v and check that my v works, I'm not using the fact that you worked, the fact that your y worked for all values of z. I'm only checking finitely many values of z. So you could, you could actually write down. It's, again, it's, it's this line here. This represents an ordinary Turing machine. You can just look at how, which values it checks, what bounds does it have, and you could sort of get lazy and say, you know, instead of giving you the y that works for every z, I'm just going to give you a y that's good enough. I'm going to give you a y, you're going to give me a y that set works up to some function f of y, because you've realized I'm never going to notice the difference. I, by the time I've checked all the values of z up to f of y, I will have verified that my v is the v I want, and I will walk away happy. And I'll never notice that your v was a fake. Or excuse me, that your y was a fake. So instead of working with an actual witness to the sigma 2 statement, I can just work with it with a good enough fake. And I will be perfectly satisfied. And I will never know, know the difference. And basically, the, the fact that there is, a, is an area called proof mining, the fact that we can take proofs of pi 2 statements and extract witnesses from them, depends entirely on this idea and the fact that you know, finding the true value of y isn't computable, but finding these fake values of y is computable. And so you can actually turn this into an actual algorithm for computing v without, without having to use oracles, because we can use the substitute y. All right. Well, that's exactly what we're going to do with proofs of pi 2 statements in pi 1 1 comprehension. So, a simple, a simple prototype for proof in pi 1 1 comprehension would look like this. You'd reason in ATR0 for a long time. You would use pi 1 1 comprehension exactly once. Then you would take the set y that you get out of pi 1 1 comprehension, and you'd reason in ATR0 again for a while, and you would get your pi 1 2 conclusion. There are more complicated things you could do. You could use pi 1 1 comprehension twice. But I am unaware of any instance in the literature in which this is done. Every actual application of pi 1 1 comprehension to prove a pi 1 2, pi 1 2 statement looks like this. Right? People just don't tend to use it multiple times in an essential way. 
So this is, this is both a convenient sort of simple case to talk about it. It's also the only case that matters for practical purposes in examples we have seen so far. So we have this, this same sort of picture, right? What has to be happening is given a set u, I'm constructing a set x. Now, I'm now reasoning in ATR0. So when I say constructing a set, I mean a hyperarithmetic set. So x is going to actually be hyperarithmetic in u. Then, hyperarithmetic in the sense of ATR0. ATR0 is wrong about what hyperarithmetic means, and, and things are slightly more complicated, but it's not too important. All right. Then we're going to take the set x, and we're going to use pi 1 1 comprehension. Pi 1 1, pi 1 1 comprehension will give us a set y. And then I'm going to take the set y, and I will construct the set v that I really want. Right? Pi 1 1 comprehension will give me my leftmost path, or it will give me my critical point of the Eklund variation principle. Right, so for example, with Christie's theorem, right, y is basically the, the critical point that Eklund variation gives us, and v is literally equal to y. Uh, no, excuse me, v is t of y. It's the thing that, that t gives us. And again, so by analogy to what happened in the, the arithmetic case, the, in the process of verifying that the, the point v we get is actually the point we want, we're actually only doing things in ATR0, which is to say we're only looking at various things that are alpha jumps of y for some, well, some countable list of alphas, which is to say there's some bound on which set z we need to look at. So by exactly the same reasoning, I didn't really need y to be what it purported to be in the beginning. I just need y to be a good enough fake. I need y to be good enough so that for the specific values of z I need to verify this last arrow, y succeeds at pretending to look like pi 1 1 comprehension, or succeeds in pretending to look like a fixed point. Um, Caristi's theorem is, is pretty typical in that actually when you look carefully through the proof, you use pi 1 1 comprehension in a very straightforward way. So, what does Christie's theorem say? So Christie's theorem says Eklund variation principle gives us this fixed point y, excuse me, this critical point y. The critical point is my fixed point v, so v is literally equal to y. In the verification that v is a fixed point, I look at t of v. So the only value of z I care about is t of v, and so all I need is a bound on how complicated t of v is. Um, so TLPP0 is the theory that promises that, that these approximate witnesses exist. Right? TLPP0 is exactly saying, for any complexity, I can find the witnesses corresponding to that complexity. And really what it's doing is saying, if I have a proof of a pi 1, 2 statement that uses pi 1, 1 comprehension exactly once, this is, what I, this is what I really needed, and this is what I do. And that's where TLPP comes from. So, Couple questions. First of all, TLPP does not capture the pi one one or the pi one two consequences of pi one one comprehension. There are definitely others. Um, there ought, morally speaking, there ought to be a hierarchy that starts with TLPP, or maybe if you want to say it this way, it starts with ATR zero as like the zeroth level, and TLPP is level one, and then there's a higher level that says, well, I don't just want things that are sigma alpha. In Y, I want things that, that are come out of additional applications of this approximate comprehension thing. It's not clear, it would take some work to write down exactly the right principle here. But, um, and given that there are no examples, I don't know how interesting that ultimately is. But in particular, having an actual theory where we can concretely say this, th this is sort of a naturalish hierarchy that gives us the pi 1, 2, consequences of pi 1 1 comprehension, that might be worth having. And, and there's, in theory, a blueprint for how to do this. But there's some real work to sort out. One question that, that's potentially harder is, can this be repeated at higher arity? So for example, pi 1 2 comprehension is a pi 1 4 axiom, which is not equivalent to any of its pi 1 3 consequences. Um, lest you think this is totally academic, 
Uh, there are examples of Pi 1, 3 statements whose only known proof goes through Pi 1, 2 comprehension. Um, they're actually not that natural, they're uh, not that unnatural. So there's stuff about existence of perfect matchings in graphs uh, that exactly falls into this category. So they're all, so presumably there's something one can do to get pi 1, 3 approximations to pi 1, 2 comprehension, but it's not clear that you can just imitate this stuff from the proof mining, because the proof mining world gets a lot more complicated when you talk about pi 1, 3 statements rather than pi 1, 2, or pi 3 rather than pi 2 statements. So it's not clear how to generalize this to higher levels of the comprehension hierarchy. And maybe sort of the most directly relevant to, to the question of higher recursion theory, so forget about uh, reverse math. You can just ask in a purely, you know, purely computational way, alpha is an actual ordinal. I want to set y with, with this property. N is capturing this comprehension sigma alpha relative to y comprehension. In just a purely computational sense, how complicated are the sets y uh, that, we need to, that we need to do this? At what level of the constructible hierarchy? You can think about this in a Kripke Plotek setting or something and look at levels of the constructible hierarchy. Or I think there are other meaningful ways to ask how complicated are these sets y that we need? You know, when alpha is, is a real ordinal and we're talking about honest computability theory. OK, that's it. Thank you. So, so I guess I mean why why is sets y with this property? Um, it's definitely str it's definitely stronger than ATR zero. Yeah, proof theoretically, it's so we do there isn't an exact ordinal analysis, but. It's probably in the vicinity of um, parameter-free pi one comprehension because it is capturing a lot of the. Um, my guess is it's actually somewhere above the Howard Bachman ordinal. It's, I think, possibly somewhere in that range. So I, I had one discussion with Michael Rathjen years ago, trying to sort of. Get a, vague, <coughs> get a vague sense of where it was, and we both sort of thought it would be like above the powered Bachman ordinal, but maybe in the vicinity of the collapse of gamma zero rather than the collapse of epsilon zero or something like that. But yeah, possibly in the vicinity of pi one one transfinite induction. Yeah. I. I think it's clear that it has to be at least the Howard Bachman ordinal. I, I think it does definitely have to be, but I'd have to check if that's actually been written down. Um, not that's been proven, because it's, I mean, if you, if you have something that's a proof that's literally like, in this form, uh, it's not hard to show that it's got to go through in TLPP0. Um, maybe using like, but I mean, not hard, meaning like, OK, use free cut elimination or something to get the proofs in normal form. But that should follow from general proof theoretic nonsense. Um, but it's not so clear. Like, even if a proof is, is sort of morally in this form, it's probably not written down exactly like that. And so yeah, I don't know exactly what the right way to say, like, what is the, the natural way to talk about proofs where TLPP is sort of capturing these proofs. Uh, where is it? Um, let's see, so I'm trying to, what happened with Frise's conjecture? So, 
So the, the other examples I know are Menger's theorem, which is this theorem about um, this generalization of the Kerning duality theorem, and um, I think the generalized Higman's theorem, a bunch of the stuff in what WQO theory went through in it. There was some, so for say, for this theorem is pi 1 1, right? Yeah, it's pi 1 2. Um, I haven't looked at Frise's theorem. I feel like there was a reason I didn't look at it, but is it not known to be provable in some weaker theory? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then yeah, I, I think I think. Pi one. Yeah. And it's pi one two. Yeah. No, I haven't looked at for say I don't remember why because that yeah that's certainly the right sort of thing. That's good. I, I don't know why. I don't remember why I haven't looked at that, looked at that more carefully because that's definitely the right the right a candidate for that. No, not. Do I know that for sure? Um, yes, because. I'm not sure it's equivalent to ATR zero, but you could prove it. You don't need TLPP because you'd only need you only need things that are like. Um, okay, so to put it this way, right, TLPP is really describing the you know you can think of this hierarchy where for each alpha you have the statement, and the equivalence with Caristi's theorem for bare alpha functions is within a couple. It's not. I don't. I'm not sure it's a level for level, but it's you know off by two or something. And so the restriction of TLPP where you only look at sigma two things or something is sufficient, and that, that is definitely weaker. So there is a hierarchy. The, the paper where, where I introduced TLPP sort of talks a little about this hierarchy of sigma alpha LPP statements. Cousin's lemma. Yeah. I. Yeah. So I think Sam Sanders and a co-author of his have some stuff on. Cousins lemma. It so because you're talking about gauges, it runs into into third order theory. So they they have this paper on look at, looking at what happens in third order theories, and I think they some some very difficult things happen where it it ends up behaving very odd. I think it ends up being. Incomparable to WKL zero, but if you combine it with WKL zero, you get something very strong, or something they can prove to be weak. But if you combine it with WKL zero, you get something strong. But also, this is very sensitive to their formulation of gauges, because it involves the fact the the reversal involves the fact that their formal their encoding of a gauge doesn't promise night potentially allows for some very defective gauges, and as soon as you rule those out, the reversal goes away. It's, so there's been some work, and it, it's, it's, there's probably more work to be done, but it's very open what's going on with that. No, provable, provable in TLPP. I, I would really like it to be equivalent, but it's between TLPP and ATR0. It could be ATR0. Every, every time I see Paul, we, we sort of go, so any luck encoding anything new? And so no one knows how to encode anything more into Menger's theorem than was already encoded into the Kernig duality theorem, which gives you ATR zero. Oh. 
well, if it's not provable in PyOne1CA, it's not provable in TLPP either. And I mean, there, it's not just that it's not provable, it's the ordinal, they prove that the ordinal strength is specifically too high. Um, yes, but it'd have to be a hierarchy. I mean, you'd have to go beyond, pi, like, TLPP is within Pi 1 comprehension. I, uh, but it would be a candidate for, the, for this, yeah, for what happens at Pi 1 2 comprehension. 